Okay. All right, everybody. Let's get started. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, so, uh, let's see. First things first, uh, I wanted to mention briefly that we uh, did have a good um, a good time last week, last week or the week before, um, uh, with the uh, the Google Hang. Uh, that was uh, the Journal Club. We, uh, for those of you who didn't get a chance to see it, the link is there in the um, in the agenda. Let me actually share my screen and switch over to that. Yeah. So uh, so that went really well. I went back and uh, did a little bit of annotating of the um, of the video. Uh, in YouTube, so that, uh, you can skip through it uh, if you want to go right to the <laughs> conversation, or if you want to skip over the parts that get, um, that get weird where I drop out. Um, so that's very cool, and uh, I, I know several people have already seen it. Um, even though it doesn't register a lot of uh, views, uh, that's because uh, I, don't, I don't think a lot of people watch it end to end, beginning to end, but um, but people are watching pieces of it. So. Um, so thanks everybody who showed up for that, and uh, I think it was very interesting times. And I think we should be thinking about um, how we can, uh, how, uh, you know, we might incorporate that. Um, I've also, um, so I think uh, up later. I've also um, started a outline for um, the publication, which is also pos partially um, what we are intending to do for one of our epics in terms of collect compiling uh, literature of all the. Uh, Information that um, relates to the gaps of simulating CLGANs. Um, I think that um, we should uh, use the um, the paper that Balash is putting together as a reference um, and probably refer to it um, in this paper. But um, that's a separate thing. Um, so if hopefully you can hit that link and see just a very rough uh, mind map outline. Um, so feel free to you know, throw things in there. Um, I think we need to schedule a couple of sessions for sort of writing uh, in the future, um, at least kind of like agreeing on what pieces we want to, to have and what sort of figures we want to have just so that we can, I think, put a target on uh, putting something out there. Um, so that would, that would be exciting. Um, and then lastly, on sort of my updates, um, we have to start prepping for the poster in Munich because it's coming up pretty quickly. Um, I think uh, I need to take the lead on that to uh, you know, get a first draft of that going. But uh, as you'll recall, this is the abstract that we uh, got accepted referring to the connectome um, and the spatial connectome. And so we also want to make sure that it's in good shape uh, to be distributed. And um, so um, I think we also need to uh, set up some time to do that. So I will, uh, I will make notes to myself to uh, send out um, meeting time requests. Okay, really for both. Okay, great. Um, so I, those are just kind of the things that I have off the top. I don't want to take too much time. Um, I do want to give Gleb a chance to um, talk about uh, what he got done. Um, over the last uh, couple weeks, because it's very exciting, and uh, kind of moves us forward with the um, Synapse position project. So, Gleb. Um, yeah, it wasn't uh, that much stuff, actually. It was just um, slapping together a lot of good work that other people have done. I basically took the pictures that we got from Stephen Cook, um, the set of, a set of very specific part of the um, see elegance pictures. Can you can you comment on what part of the pictures we have, Stephen? Yeah, it's the um, it's the ventral cord of the hermaphrodite, and so um, that's important for us because the muscle cell that we're interested in um, is well, actually, I think the muscle that we're interested in is on the dorsal side, but this is this is the ventral side, sort of looking specifically at if you. As you go along the bottom of, of the worm, and you're looking at the way that muscle cells are innervated by motor neurons, you want to know um, basically where those synapses are along that chain. So it's a more uh, detailed shot of those as opposed to, say, a reconstruction of 
the um, the head where the nerve cord is, or um, a reconstruction of say like the tail and the male, which a paper just came out on by the way um, from the Emmons lab. So yeah, it's it's basically running along the bottom of the worm, uh, giving you the ability to see the relationship between uh, muscle cells and the motor neurons that uh, touch them. Cool. Yeah. So it was just messing around with Amazon instances and Django to get that to work, um, fixing CatMade a little bit more. Um, besides that, um, yeah, I guess we have a lot more work cut out ahead of us to get the annotation working. Yeah. So if you click on if you click on that link, guys, um, that's there. Um, this is this is our instance running off of uh, you know the OpenWorm account, and you should uh, you should click on test three under CLGANs, and you'll uh, here I'll uh, I'll share my screen just so that everybody can see it. Um, it's uh, here, so it's a, it's sort of a fragment, right? So originally, um, I was uh, I was wondering what data set we were going to get. So this is this is sort of a fragment under you know at the bottom of the worm. So imagine, um, let's see, let me well uh, imagine that this is the um, the cuticle, and uh, as it goes around like this, it would you you'd see more of the of the worm, but it's focused in just on the bottom. The way that you step through this um, is using this slider here, and um, oh, it's a little bit slow. As I release it, you can see I get different um, I get different images here. So they've all been sort of taken in a stack, and then they've been aligned more or less <laughs> um, here at the bottom. So uh, we've uh, we've got. The project plan for this uh, also linked there in the um, meeting notes. I um, actually need to update that a little bit with this with this progress. Um, but that is uh, where we are. Uh, the idea from here is to have people log in and um, be able to help us start um, marking the synapses. Um, Steve Cook, um, I think, yeah, so we invited him to this, but. Uh, I think um, we're going to have to have a separate session on that too, so that we can uh, get that going. He's told us some of the limitations about handling users and this sort of thing, um, but I think that um, these are things that we can start to address. So, um, well, it may have been knitting together other people's stuff, but um, it's still very cool to actually have this up and have an instance that we can use and have real data in it. So, thank you very much, Bill, for that. Um, Anything on the other points here um, that uh, we just took notes from before? Um, you've, I, you've probably been running around doing a lot of other stuff, but um, just wanted to close the loop on things like WebSockets, JSON, getting started, links to package Eclipse Juno. Those things sound familiar. Um, I kind of yeah, we, we haven't we haven't made I mean we haven't made any progress on the other ones, um, and the other stuff in these past couple weeks. I guess okay. when we have the packages, for the stuff. The thing is, we haven't been using them as often, so I don't know if we want to wait. Uh, we could just post like what we have, like, at least a link to it, um, if that would be useful to people. I don't know how many people have been asking for that for the Eclipse getting started stuff. That's yeah, on, uh, that's on S3. So the one that led packaged. That we have a bucket that's called Eclipse Distros, and there is the Ubuntu one that Gleb packaged, and the one that Matteo packaged. Now I talked to Sergey, and he's going to package the one for Windows. So once we have the three of them, makes sense to create a wiki document saying these are the Open Worm Eclipse distributions for all the operating systems, basically. So I talked to Sergey today, and he told me that. Uh, is is at summer camp at the moment. That's why he's not here at the meeting. And um, basically, when he's back, he's gonna package that. And uh, I, I guess we'll put we we'll put something together, and it covers this last point. I think on Gleb's stuff. I guess we we'll put we we'll put all of them out together. I guess it doesn't make sense maybe just to create one for Ubuntu like. We put it out with with all the OSs. That'd be good. Yeah. Um, I mean, 
people don't directly ask for it, but then again, people do get stuck sometimes um, setting up the development environment. So uh, yeah. Chris Tull, who was here last time, I just exchanged a note with him uh, as to how it was going, and um, it apparently had been a, a larger effort for him to get the development environment up, and I think he got stuck at a certain point. And so it's, um, you know, he's, he's also got a lot of things going on, but I just think that um, it will be helpful to have this, um, uh, you know, some of these pieces easy to use. So actually last night, although I don't have very much to show for it yet, um, I was on Amazon again, and I was um, looking at uh, basically getting the whole thing installed as a, um, uh, actually getting Ubuntu desktop set up and, and connecting to it through the uh, no machine uh, interface so that um, you could, you know, which is like a VNC, um, so that you could actually have uh, an, the, like an instance of Eclipse uh, set up with all of the, um, you know, packages uh, preloaded and the code preloaded and uh, just snapshot that AMI and then um, like point people at it and say, you know, if you want to have a complete running copy of the uh, development environment with all the Eclipse goodness all set up, you can just uh, snapshot this AMI and you'll have, you know, Eclipse ready to go um, with all those pieces. In addition, and, and, and it'll have the code uh, you know, the latest version of the code downloaded so that people can basically just download a NoX client and connect to it and, you know, a very basic tutorial would just basically say, you know, how to run uh, the current version of the code and, uh, you know, it would, could, it would even, you know, you'd be able to use, um, you know, Firefox, uh, Linux Firefox through the Ubuntu desktop uh, connection on, on Amazon. It would just be that they would need to have an Amazon account, basically. Um, does that sound like something that would be a good idea? And also, I know that Giovanni, you've done something like this before to set up a visual. It was really clunky, so I did set up a VNC server and tried to connect to it from my machine with the. Into I mean, the, the the goal was what I wanted to do is set up a development environment up there just so that we could maybe debug. At the moment, uh, at the time, I didn't have uh, anyone. In and no one in the project was it was on Ubuntu, so we basically wanted to have an Ubuntu environment, and right. uh, also I take a snapshot of all the stuff you're saying. But it was like incredibly clunky and difficult to work with because the VNC said like it's probably even just the fact that I am not a Linux expert, expert so I ran into all sorts of issues. I I ended up being able to connect to it remotely. So I, I was like remote into this Amazon machine and I could see the desktop, but it was like very slow and uh, all sorts of like problems. Uh, anything you click, it, like, it came up with errors and stuff, so I just gave up in the end. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> if yeah. you managed to do it, it would be nice, but uh, I don't know. I, I mean, it, 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 it's not something you can do in couple of hours spare time kind of thing, I think. Well, so I, I found some blogs, and, and one of the things that uh, is clear is that VNC is, is the much slower option compared yeah. to with, uh, No Machine. Um, and I was getting pretty good performance um, when I was playing with it last night. Um, actually, I got pretty far. I mean, I, I did install Eclipse. I did, uh, you know, get, uh, you know, I opened up ports and all that good stuff. Um, Actually, ran into the same problem, Gleb, that um, we had on CatMade, which is that I need to I need to mount another uh, EBS store because I was running out of space. Um, but uh, I think that's pretty straightforward, which is some of the the, the commands there. So um, I don't know. I mean, would other people find this this useful? Like, just kind of have like a dev environment that you can. I mean, ultimately, you probably like if you really want to do hardcore development, you probably are going to want to follow these instructions and probably want to use some of these other packaged, um, you know, Eclipse versions, but uh, it might not hurt if, um, you know, it is like a 10-minute setup of, you know, put your Amazon keys in and um, and uh, fire up, a, you know, a new instance. Uh, it might not hurt if people can poke around and play with it um, as well, in my view, but, um, I don't know, others? I wouldn't use it. Um... I, well, yeah, you wouldn't use it, but you're... But you're, you're, like, you're correct it. that someone might use it, but depends on how, how long it takes you to do it, to be honest. All right. 
Yeah, well, it's your time, so you have to call it. Um, from from what I've seen, it's pretty unusable in terms of remote and to the thing and like working with Eclipse remotely. It's like a bit of a I, I wouldn't if it's just like to run it and look at it. Oh, it works. Then yes, but I wouldn't do any remote development like that. Why? It's not like you get pretty frustrated pretty quick. Yeah. In my experience, but uh, I mean. In terms of having something that you can point people to and, sh and tell them, look, this is a version that you can try remotely and it shows that everything is working and maybe they can use it as an example when they set up their own thing and stuff. So that, that, that is valuable. I think having these distributions, Eclipse distribution that people can just download and they, I, it's really, that, that will help a lot. So for example, Chris that was trying to do that, you would just download the, uh, whatever OS he has. It just downloads the version of Eclipse with package. And that's like 80% of the work done because it doesn't have to manually install all the plugins. It just has to get, it just has to get down Virgo and, uh, okay, there's a bunch of manual steps as well that we will have to automate that are not automated yet. But I mean, the, the Eclipse distribution thing, I think it's a, it's a very nice thing to have, and it will like go a long way in terms of facilitating adoption. Okay. Well, let's let's aggregate then all these all these pieces together and uh, put them on a page, um, and that we can you know, point people to um, both the development environment and downloading the um, you know uh, the jars for the server so that you can run it even outside of development environment, and then um, if yeah, that that would be nicer in my opinion. I mean. Spending time, do you remember that stuff you were looking at uh, a couple of weeks back? Matteo helped out. Yeah. Like running the thing locally on Virgo without the development environment. So that's another nice thing. Yeah. Probably, probably more useful than uh, the Amazon snapshot with the development environment, I think. So, so that they can see it running locally without installing the development environment. That, I think that they would be more useful, but just that's just my opinion. Yep. 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 Cool. All right. Let's uh, let's keep going. So the um, so the uh, the paper um, by Balash is still in sitting in the uh, in the Dropbox um, under the um, folder name Balash Paper and Source. Um, has anybody had a chance to read it yet? Um, the PDF is in there. I've given a very brief look at it. Okay. Um, um, any thoughts to motivate others? It does overlap a little bit with the kind of paper you had, were discussing there to kind of outline the goals of the project. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I mean, it's good that there are there would be two papers, but I mean, is this intended to give a um, an outline to the project or? Uh, a personal view on where the field should be going? Um, well, so the, the one I'm thinking about um, as related to this, so this one is talking about the sort of the behavioral Turing test, right, and the Turing chemical history yeah. for um, when you think a model is complete, which is, which is important. Um, what it leaves out are things uh, sort of like the... Um, uh, well, it, it doesn't leave out, I guess, but it, it talks very briefly about the um, progress with, say, the physics and the uh, simulation engine and some of the things that are a bit more on the technical side. Um, so these would be some of the updates in, in terms of methods, I think, that we would want to describe, you know, um, just kind of targeting when SPH is finished, um, you know, what's going to be the write-up and the, and the discussion of that, and what kind of... Um, what kind of standard do we want to have just for that single milestone? So this, I think this paper is a bit more like looking into the future, uh, a bit more long term, and this is more what I'm thinking about is a bit more of a um, shorter term progress report that's put out as a public. Yeah. So. Yep. Um, okay, so it, those of you who haven't had a chance to read it, uh, have a look. I'll be, um, so, so Balash, by the way, is getting married. So congratulations, Balash. Um, and he's getting married um, in the next uh, few weeks, I think. Um, so he's out of commission, uh, you know, doing doing that stuff and, and getting 
uh, all prepared for that. But um, after that's all settled down, both the marriage and the honeymoon and whatever it is, right? Um, it will be, um, uh, we'll be able to get him back on the line. But I think um, in the meantime, we should uh, you know take a pass at uh, you know offering our ideas and comments and and, and concepts to to this paper, and also you know giving him feedback on where he might uh, go to get it published. I think after he, he got through writing it, he sort of said, well, where, what journal would, would accept this? And um, so um, maybe some thoughts on that. Um, so I think we should also schedule a time. I think our paper writing time should potentially incorporate both of these um, topics. OK. Um, so Andre is not here. I will move his stuff to the end. And uh, Matteo is, I believe, in the process of moving to London. Um, yes, actually, on that point, um, I don't know if most people know, but um, that's an announcement as well. That Matteo is actually joining the Silver Lab here in London uh, for the next year as a software developer. So he will actually be working on, mainly on neuromel related stuff uh, on the open source brain uh, project but it will be significant overlap with everything he's doing already. Uh, so he will be um, updating the simulation engine um, and basically any of the tools which he's been working on for uh, the Open Worm project, just making sure that they're uh, happily NeuroML compliant and can be used with lots of the other models in the open source brain database. So, but he's going to be working full time on that and related stuff for the next year. Will that, will that be his head behind you um, next time? Quite possibly, yes. <laughs> it will save one space on the uh, Google Hangout. Okay. <laughs> Useful. It would be nice, like, since, since now we'll have to Silver Lab members uh, in, the, in the project, it would be nice to have a, a partner's page on the Open World website and say Silver Lab is a partner of the Open World project. Sure. I don't know how the lab would feel about that, but it would be nice. For I'm us. sure, yeah, that should be fine, yeah. 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 That'll be cool. Yeah. Great. Let's go. So I think he's uh he will be starting in about a month or so and he's in the process of moving at the moment. So cool. Nice. All right. Um well while while we're on you, Korg, um let me uh pull some of the things uh from you up and uh those a bit. So uh how was CNS? CNS went well. Um uh usual hectic meeting, five or six days of computational neuroscience. But I did have the presentation on the open source brain initiative. Uh so that went down quite well. I think people were happy that somebody was doing something in that area trying to get and share models. Um, so the, during the session there was a, about 100, 100, 200 people uh, at the presentation, which was good. And at the end, the chair of the session uh, asked whether people would be willing to share their models in an open source fashion. And, and um, about half the people present put their hands up saying that they would be happy to share the models. But they were assuming that, of course, uh, somebody else would convert them to NeuroML and uh, do all the nice things to make them uh, useful. So, But um, it was quite positive. went down quite well. I did show, flash up uh, an image of the C yeah, organs in NeuroML. And um, it was, yeah, got some good um, um, uh, feedback from that. Well, so I don't know if you've um, noticed any updates on the activity on the website. Uh, I haven't, but I should go back. Do you want to link us there so that everybody can see? Uh-oh. Is. Okay. So there's um, a, a link to the open source brain. Um, I didn't notice any major um, uptake in traffic on the open source brain okay. website, but there might have been some on the open, uh, uh, open worm, but, not sure. but in general the meeting went quite well. So 
perhaps, and, and later on this evening. So at this point, what, what are the steps going forward um, for, um, for this project? Um, as I, I think you had mentioned it to me um, in a previous state of, of becoming, and now um, it's obviously released to the public. So um, what are kind of the next uh, stages that, uh, that you see with folks um, on here? OK. Um, we're basically concentrating on, uh, on a lot of the um, uh, existing models in NeuroML at the moment, so a lot of multi-compartmental conductance-based models that are already in NeuroML version 1. So the idea here would be that try to get um, people interested in Purkinje cell models uh, to collaborate, uh, make sure that it's, uh, the NeuroML is up to date, it's annotated, um, and that it can map nicely to various simulators like Neuron and Genesis and so on. And hopefully with the models we have there from the cerebellum and cortex, try to um, build a community of people interested in uh, this type of modeling interested in the cells specifically, but also the technologies, the tools that are neuromel compliant to contribute to this. Um, I mean, there's a link there to the C. elegans project as well. So in an ideal scenario, there'll be people just interested in tools, uh, just want a bunch of uh, cells and networks to run on their simulator, who want to come here to test them. Uh, people specifically interested in the cerebellum just want the latest uh, models. They're not worried about which particular simulator. They just try to get the most up-to-date and recent versions of the models, and in that way, get people talking about them, give a bit of feedback. There's wiki pages associated with each of the projects, um, and yeah, in that way, promote NeuroML, uh, get better models out of it, and get better tools that do interesting things with the models. Cool. So that's a lot of what Matteo is going to be doing is both on the website itself, but also uh, related tools, normal tools. And ideally, all of this will be relevant from there for C. elegans, but also uh, anything else on there as well. Awesome. OK. Um, and um, do you know any news about the uh, multi-compartmental Python API? Um, anything else? Um, it's progressing. I think we have another Skype on that tomorrow, but um, I think it's progressing slowly but surely. Um, it's probably, since it's focusing on NeuroML2, it's probably not directly relevant for the C. elegans just yet, but um, anything that's useful there will be useful for C. elegans down the line as well. So, um, uh, one of the points that were raised in the journal club last uh, last time was that um, the uh, in, about the cell modeling paper that uh, standards were not used because they they were actually pushing some of the algorithms beyond um, where they had been. And uh, my thought is um, that uh, you know you use standards you know where they can help, but obviously in this case um, it would have it would have been publishing this paper. What's an interesting opportunity, it seems to me now, is to see if um, you know some of the standards would catch up. And obviously, it's not such so much a neuromel thing, but I mention it here because because of the connection with LEM to SPML, yeah. Yeah. and um, to what extent the SPML community is is going to look at this uh, paper and embrace it and try to uh, you know encode uh, pieces of it in you know and, and and by so doing expanding SPML. Yeah. I mean, well, from our point of view, I mean, the two of these go hand in hand. I mean, um, the thing is, there are interesting models out there that are completely within the scope of NeuroML version 1, uh, very detailed Prandtl cell models. Um, but, um, yeah, and those are perfectly fine within the scope of version 1 and version 2, uh, but people just don't share them, or they're in some, or some format like Neuron. So, I mean, a, a system like this would allow you to get them into a standard and get people who are not necessarily worried about the specifics just doing interesting things with the cell models themselves. But if there are things specific to Neuron that NeuroML doesn't support yet that it's incorporated in one of those models, it can still go in the open source brain and the NeuroML model, or Neuron model, can be kept up to date and the developments in NeuroML2 can at least try to incorporate all of those requirements. I mean, an example is the Goldman, Hodgkin, Katz currents which wasn't in uh, NeuroML version 1, but is in published models in Neuron and Genesis. And there are versions of cells on there with this type of current. And NeuroML 2 has to kind of keep up and uh, incorporate those type of currents. And 
I mean, so it's an interaction between the models that are there that need these type of features and building this into the language as it goes along. So, I mean, I think that's really the only way. I mean, you can't, unfortunately, completely decide on the scope of uh, these uh, standards before actively using it to build models. Right. So. Yeah. Let's just let's just be sure that we, you know, as we're feeding back to the SPML group um, uh, and seeing what kind of, uh, you know, what how they're taking the, uh, you know, this sort of progress. Um, I think um, interesting to see how that evolves related to this. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else? Um, well, just briefly, I did uh, manage to go through the process of installing the Eclipse and Juno and managed to get to the front end um, uh, working. I didn't manage to get the uh, back end uh, simulation, example simulation working, but I think it might just be something minor. Uh, but I'll need to look into that again. But most of the process went fairly smoothly and everything installed and I got the latest versions from Git and so on. Did you do that on Mac OS? On Ubuntu. On Ubuntu? OK, great. Did you, yeah. did you download the um, package version that Glad uh, zipped up? No, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, latest uh, standard oh, yeah. Juno okay. release. So you went through the process of installing all the plugins yourself? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you able? Oh, cool. so, all right, good. Well, so mostly, mostly worked, so. No. It's, it's doable. So we so we need to figure out what so do you, what was the do you know what the sticking point was for the the back end sample simulation? What kind of error? Not certain. Not certain. Um, I'll look at it in the next few days again, and I'm sure in a month's time I'll have the tail here for first time support. Okay. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna I'm really gonna push to uh, to make this uh, you know simple and. Um, because I think that I mean, the uh, is, uh, I mean, probably Patrick didn't even know that we had that zipped version, but uh, that that could like, if you, if you had downloaded that zipped version of for Ubuntu, then probably it, at least we would know that it works somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, it might be just something minor, so I'll I'll look at it again, but I'm I'm happy to go through the full process to try to actually get everything installed. Okay. All right. Cool. Well, thanks for thanks for doing it. And thanks for running through it. Um, it's important that we you know have multiple people giving it a shot, um, and it's good that you could get the, the front end um, working. So that's good progress. Okay. Um, good stuff. Let's uh, let's move on. So Alex, uh, um, on the muscle cell data meeting, you saw that I sent out a um, invite for that. Um, I think I got uh, one reply to that uh, today. Um, let's see, what did we get? Yes, that was you. Um, I, would, I haven't heard, I haven't had a, a response from Mike. I've got the feeling that he's been sort of in um, in um, Python, uh, NeuroML Python API land uh, a bit. So I think maybe we should just perceive the two of us, Alex, um, see what we can do. Um, so okay. uh, did you have time to take a look on the graphs I made on the data? On the which one? Uh, the pictures, the charts of the data. Um, no. Remind me again. Point me to those again. I'm so sorry. Uh, the new data we have, uh, I made the small pictures with the charts of these data. Yes. And we were going to understand which exactly data it is. So did you have time to look at it? Oh yes, the charts, right, 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 right. And um, well, we, we posted that in the. Um, uh, I just want to go back to like the um, muscle cell data. Yes, right, and the PNGs. Oh, very good. Yes. Um, well. Um, in terms of some of the time courses, um, um, I think we can at least say, you know, we can tell the difference between uh, some of the very fast-moving, um, some of the things that are collected over long time scales and some of the things that are collected over a 
over shorter time scales. Um, so that is one thing that is that is useful. I haven't reached out back to the original uh, donor of this data um, for those pieces, but I think that um, I think maybe we had lost the thread here on this particular on our um, um, on our update sheets for um, what question we wanted to answer with these with these images. We're looking to I mean so we know that they're collect collected from muscle cell. We know that they're from different time uh, time amounts. How long um, they're recorded for? Um, what else do we need beyond that in order to move forward? Do you think? Uh, well. Um we have the data for several different experiments, right? Yes. And uh, do we know which TXT file corresponds to which experiment, or don't we? Yes. So that was the. Um, to the, the first question. Yes. So, Dennis, the contributor. Um, I'm looking right through the email right now. So he had replied telling us um, the experimental conditions for the two files that he had sent, right? And so I'm just scrolling through right now to find that. On a very long thread. And um, So they're recording synaptic release of neurotransmitter from 30 to 60 seconds. And Okay, well, I'll look for it again and send it to you, but basically it has the experimental conditions specifically in terms of what was the current injection that was given um, in, order to, um, in order to see the outputs. Mm -hmm. So we do, we do have that. Um, okay, great. I did know. Yeah. Well, I can't find it, but... Okay, anyway, so yeah, let me set up this time with you that, um, that you pulled out there on the poll, and we can um, go over it in more detail. Yeah. Sure. Sorry, everybody. This is just like 86 message long thread. Oh, yeah, here we go. Right. For spontaneous 50s, it is spontaneous, uh, right. Uh, it is spontaneous evoked with holding current zero picoamps. And then for C cramp, it is uh, zero picoamps for. Uh, 100 milliseconds, minus 20 picoamps, 5 milliseconds. Okay, let me forward this to you. And, and, um, yeah. Okay, good. So the muscle cell data project, I think, has suffered a bit from the fact that the <laughs> muscles, uh, the, uh, the synapse position project has actually been making a lot of progress, so um, I think we need to just kind of like rally on that particular project and, and get that moving. Um, okay. Um, Sergey is at camp. Matteo is somewhere between uh, Cork and London. Um, so we will skip them. And Tim, what's up? Yeah, I've just been working on um, a couple things. Well, we talked about the um, from the uh, cell simulation. We talked about uh, mutations and needing to be able to express that 
uh, through our simulation to make sure that our worm is what we expect it to be. So I've been I've been trying to put some some data there as far as some experimental data that we might be able to use. Um, so I've been trying to just gather some some information there, <clears throat> and <clears throat> I've been working on the sensory uh, sen sensory uh, neurons more as well, trying to figure out more how they work and how they um, how they influence the uh, system. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. So, um, so you've been reading that paper, um, that cell paper. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In detail. So, um, what do you think in terms of uh, scaling the um, scaling a simulation like that from a uh, genetic sequence that has 500,000 bases or 0.5 megabases into something that has 97? Uh, megabases, sort of a, you know, a uh, two order of magnitude increase in, in, in complexity. Yeah, well, I think we got to get there. I mean, I think always so that's been our long term goal, but I think we're, <laughs> we got a lot to do before we get there. <laughs> so, yeah, in, in some post discussion with Jonathan Carr, the, um, you know, the author of that, of that great paper, well, the one of the one of the authors, one of the two first authors, um, he's uh, you know he's definitely thinking as well about you know scaling this at some point in the future um, up. So I think that we want to you know be in touch with him. I think one of the things that is very illuminating about this in terms of you know us and and, and you Tim as well is because um, I think your interest tends to be in you know kind of getting the big picture and uh, and doing a lot of the research. Um, is those individual data sets that, that kind of went into this, right? The, the different um, publicly available databases of, um, you know, metabolites and, uh, you know, structure of, um, of, of the metabolites and uh, the specific sequences of genes and this kind of thing. All these data are, um, as far as I can tell, there are a lot of these pieces that are available for C. elegans that are analogous to the ones that are available for, um, for microplasma. So um, it might be real interesting to, to see like a one-on-one -on -one comparison of the, the kinds of data sets that were needed as inputs um, into, um, you know, in, into their model. And uh, if we can just, if we can just find, just do an inventory to say like, okay, for that mycoplasma data set or for that one that was pulled from E. coli, um, do we have something like that in C. elegans? And uh, when it comes to defining the gaps for this, uh, for this paper, that's that's exactly one of the things that we said that we were going to do. We were going to find out, you know, for C. elegans, what is missing to do a real simulation. Now I think we have a template uh, with this, at least to, to to do the stuff which is inside the cell. And then, you know, we've been doing a lot of the work on cell to cell interaction. So just a thought, if you know, if if you want to, you know, have a look at that, that would be I think a huge contribution just to see, you know, side to side. You know, are those data available? A lot of the papers for the C. elegans versions of those data sets are in, in the Mendeley folder, I've, like uh, the, the genome sequence and the, the proteome and the metabolome of the C. elegans. All those are in, the, are in there. You can just you know, search around for them. We think we've compiled a lot of them. Um, but it would be really interesting to see which are there and which are not compared to the car model. So. I agree. And that's, you're right on. I mean, I, I couldn't say it any better. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, and that's that's exactly what I, I would like to be I'd like to get for us is that detail, and uh, that's it's a, it's a pretty pretty big project, but um, uh, that's what I'm working towards. Yeah, so I, I can imagine just a grid, right, where you know you've right. got the you got the I don't know however many data tables here for car, and then we, we go over here for for C. elegans, and we say you know do we have them, do we not? Um, I think that would be very very useful. So, okay. Yeah. If you if you get a chance, if that's if that's interesting. Yeah, it is, and, and definitely. I, I will uh, I will work towards that goal. Thanks. Okay. Looks like we got uh, Andre in. Andre, right. yeah. Just in time, sir. <laughs> How are you? We we realized that uh, Sergey is uh, I think back on camp or something. Mm -hmm. So um, um, let us know what's going on uh, in your world. Uh, Sergey is um, at um, educational uh, school uh, in computational neuroscience, so he's uh, getting new knowledge 
uh, which will be possibly implemented for the purposes okay. of our project. Uh, the newest uh, um, amount of um, data and, um, well, some techniques uh, from a lot of uh, specialists, professors who came from all over the world uh, to share their wisdom. Uh, so <laughs> we wait for his return and his, um, mm, I'll say, okay, his results of attending this. Uh, as for me, mm, I have, uh, well, I can say that I have finally um, solved the problem with uh, PCI's page. Uh, I have found the bug and uh, for this, um, I had to, um, at every iteration and every um, step of the algorithm, um, I um, yeah, dumped the file uh, all the parameters uh, for all particles, uh, data on uh, coordinates, velocity, acceleration, pressure, and so on. Uh, and only this uh, step by step um, allowed me to find the place where uh, <laughs> instability starts to happen and what line um, applied to what um, piece of data causes this. And surprisingly, it was a uh, calculation of um, viscose forces. Uh, I couldn't <laughs> expect this uh, simple uh, thing. Uh, will um, bring so much problem. Uh, and to my surprise, um, I suspected that uh, it would be um, a prediction correction uh, algorithm, the core of uh, PCI's PH, but it was okay <laughs> already two weeks uh, before. So now it finally works uh, stable, uh, continuously for many steps. Very nice. But um, it took quite a long time uh, during these two weeks. So I only started. I'm only at the beginning of um, starting work with um, elastic matter. Sergey also um, has um, some um, start in this, some amount of work done. But um, I'm not sure um, how to. Um, combined his uh, code um, in which PCI speech still not works and my code and as well <laughs> the code um, with uh, surface tension which uh, will soon work in Eugene's uh, version. By the way, he has returned and uh, we uh, often communicate with him uh, in the Institute. So he also uh, moves forward. Well, I think that when Sergey will return, uh, we will work uh, together uh, with him and you, Jinze, to try to uh, combine everything we have uh, working to one uh, very good <laughs> version, which does everything uh, which we need. So, here is the current state of our work. Cool. So the question is, is, is the cat on your desk helping uh, you debug the SVH? Uh, I can see him creeping into the frame on the right. <laughs> Seriously, though, um, that's awesome. Uh, is, there, um, is there any new sort of demo to show uh, with, the, with the bug fix, things, that, things not blowing up uh, sort of thing? Possibly I can, I can try to run it now. Um, okay. um, and the other thing is, is, is there anything that's worth, uh, you know, pushing up to, to Git at this point? Oh, sorry. Uh, this is what I didn't understand the last phrase. Oh, uh, is there, um, is it in a state where it's worth doing a push to GitHub? Yes, I can do it, uh, if it will not require um, serious, um, if it doesn't contain um, 
serious changes from the point of view of the system, and it will not um, ask me to make um, manual um, uh, solve solving conflicts or how it's called. Um, I have never done it. Okay. I don't know that other people. Have, I don't know that other people have been committing into that repository other than you. So I think it'll probably just should be, be fine. fine. Yeah, it should probably be fine. I think only Sergey is. Ah, uh, yes, he's the only. He's the only one who can who can uh, who might be conflicting with you. So. so uh, once uh, one of the latest versions um, when we um, were trying to. Um, Upload it together with Sergey in the institute. Uh, we got into this, so um, the system told that um, a lot of uh, conflicts and we need to uh, solve them. Mm. So after that, I continued my work, and Sergey has uh, solved this problem uh, by his own, and I still don't know how to um, uh, do it. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. Oh. Okay, anyway, I will try to um, run it uh, and show uh, the screen in maybe 30 seconds. Okay, great. While you're getting that up, uh, Giovanni, uh, let's, let's go to you. Yeah, another thing, I mean, just on top of what Andre said is that when Andre, uh, when Sergey comes back, then we need to get all these awesome changes into the um, a uh, Java version of the solver, mm -hmm. of the bug fixes and stuff. Uh, hopefully, by that time we can work on the visualization side of things. It's pretty close. So yeah, for the rest, I, I basically spent all my time working on polishing that neural simulation demo. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that it should be finished in the sense that I don't want to touch it again. <laughs> Uh, as is, as in, it's a proof of concept. Now it works. Everything is put out into a configuration file. All the bugs that we knew of are fixed. And uh, I just want to point that uh, the last one was the toughest, and it was the thing about the compressed uh, spikes. Mm. But that's fixed. Uh, I just posted. I am posting a link. I might have helped with that. So the check-in is from Mate, but just look at that. I'm, I'm sure you will appreciate how frustrating that <laughs> that is. <laughs> uh huh. So, but that's basically the bug that I've been chasing for a month. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like basically removing stuff from a list, but the list was getting shorter. So. <laughs> You only need to remove the first and not the end. <laughs> now, you, so lost, you lost count of how many hours of your life you wasted trying to find that. I, I wasted a lot of hours. And then I just said to Matteo, look at it, let's look at it together and line by line and we spent like maybe maybe six hours together just looking at um, dumps of the actual uh, data objects and it made it uh, and we found it. See, Andre, if you if you commit to Git, you can also write um, you know change comments like this uh, so that you can um, so that we can see uh, the one line change that needed to be made that cost you know that caused uh, you know uh, months of uh, aging. Um. Uh, so yeah. Okay. Uh, the rest of the stuff, I think. I did some other stuff. Oh, yeah, one thing is, is, is Gleb gone? Um, I don't know, maybe yeah. he can still hear us, but he's out of his chair. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, basically, the last time we tried to run it on Gleb's machine, it was working okay, but one thing we are learning is that on different systems, you have to tweak configuration to get it to work as smoothly. So now everything is pulled out into a configuration file, so if it's slow, you can increase the number of the steps that go the run on the on the GPU every cycle, and that makes it faster. So, for example, on Ubuntu on Gleb system, it worked, but 
it was slower than on my machine, Matteo's machine. So by increasing the step, it, it did become faster, but increasing the step was uncovering the bug that we just fixed. So now, now it should work fine, <laughs> regardless of the configuration parameters. So I, I look at this as a proof of concept of the full architecture stuff, stack. I don't want to touch it again. It's like this is like the first basic implementation. Now let's do the actual thing, and in particular, basically the visualization of the SPH. And uh, I'm starting to look at what's involved in doing a simplified world kind of thing. So I'm, I'm basically moving on to those at okay. the moment. Um, there's also a new video that I captured and I, put, I, upload, I updated the website to embed it. So there's a link to that. And something that we have to show. show. Great. Oh, Steve, can we actually run that? Oh, here we go. Oh, so it looks like we got. Let, let's run that after we uh, do this, too. Okay. So. What do you want to run? The, um, the video you just uh, linked. Oh, yeah. I can run the actual thing if you want. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's see uh, Andre's Andre's screen here. Okay. So what's new? What's different about this, uh, Andre? Because I think for a lot of folks, this looks pretty similar. It's uh, not compresses anymore. So um, the volume uh, and uh, density uh, now uh, keeps constant. Uh, and in uh, ordinary SPH, um, it was uh, an in basic SPH, it was an ordinary situation when um, this initial uh, cube of uh, water falls down uh, and um, maybe compressed twice. Uh, so there are times when uh, density is not uh, 1,000 uh, as uh, for real uh, water, but maybe 10,000. And uh, in other phase, when it <laughs> jumps um, from this um, compressed uh, situation, it can be, um, it has density less than uh, 100, and um, this PCI SPH, uh, all its purpose was uh, to keep density uh, constant, um, so make liquid uh, incompressible, and it makes it much more realistic and uh, physically correct. So, cool. so no, this is all. So what's it going to take, Andre, for us to get um, those Jello cubes uh, sitting in this uh, pool of uh, of liquid and having the interfacing work correctly? Is that a is that a demo that we can reasonably target soon? Yes, sure. Um, when problems with this um, are finally solved, um, it's our next uh, nearest uh, target. And uh, well, it was Sorry. once um, uh, solved for um, single CPU version, but without liquid. But uh, well, uh, it should uh, already worked uh, in that uh, very old version. Uh, I have just uh, we just switched to um, our ch challenges to make uh, parallel OpenCL and so on. Uh, that's why it was not completed. But we can use that a part of that code, for example, to build it into uh, our uh, new code. And so uh, I think that in the next two weeks, I plan to complete uh, it. If there will be no uh, such surprises at, uh, like this, um, which, um, well, it really took a month uh, <laughs> of my time for debugging. Yeah. Yep. So uh, yeah, if we can get those Jello cubes in this in this liquid, that is really you know the, the step that we that we need then um, to demonstrate that we can um, go to the next level of actually modeling the muscle cell as you know more of a sphere or more of a shaped thing like the cube, right? And then um, and then have it actually um, you know interfacing with uh, you know other material. Obviously, you know this, but um, but uh, just for everybody's for everybody's sake. Also, um, in terms of the speed on that, is that um, is that is that CPU or is that uh, is that OpenCL uh, driven? Because it did seem that was a little slower than I've seen some of the previous demos. It's a CPU and it's um, a debug version. Um, I intentionally uh, done it to 
to, um, to make a break point to um, get a start from the beginning, uh, not spending time for um, sharing screen and so on when the most interesting starting phase <laughs> right, 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 right. And runs out of <laughs> screen. Yeah. So uh, speed, uh, speed is okay in the simulation. Um, speed is still fine. Okay, very good. I feel like you know we we obviously we worked on this a long time, and and the reason it's because it's you know it's hard, and um, and it's something that um, you know uh, other people haven't done, so we don't have a lot of other work to to build on. Although you have been having conversations, I think, with others, you know, building out these algorithms, which is good, but we're really kind of on the bleeding edge of this. Um, but I think that that's going to put us in a great position because you know we're going to be able to model physics of this uh, organism that no one else has uh, ever done. So um, I'm excited for having this groundwork laid and then you know seeing a much more rapid um, you know increase into actually building the model of uh, you know the the pieces that we want of the body and of the um, of the muscle cell inside the body and, and, and so forth um, as we get there. So I think that um, everybody will be really excited um, as we can you know, move to that point. Um, okay, anyway, awesome. So that's good. I'm glad that we've gotten there. Um, it's very good. Uh, Giovanni, did you, um, you got to the end of your thing? Okay, um, yeah, this video, is that something we can share? In yeah, it's usual stuff. It's like you've seen that before. It's nothing new. It's just that there's no bugs anymore. Okay. It's on the website as well, embedded on the showcase for the simulation engine. Oh, you've updated it there? Yeah. Okay. Well, for some reason when I'm in public Hangout, I can't open any of my apps, um, my Hangout app. So I'll just uh, throw the link there in so others, others can yeah. see as well. Yeah. It's the okay. same stuff. So. And I, I think now it's at, at the stage that we can confidently say that it's a proof of concept and we'll basically use it to, to build on top of it to do more serious things. Okay, great. All right, well, um, we have fewer folks today than usual, so um, we got through a lot of those updates pretty quickly. I just want to review the epics again for this release, um, just kind of check in on where we are. Um, some things are moving along nicely. Other things I think we're going to need to accelerate uh, to get, get pieces moving, but um, um, you know, uh, let's, let's just have a look. So uh, marking synapses. So um, we made a lot of progress in that in the last two weeks, being able to log into. So um, we get we have CatMate up. We have real CLGANs data. Um, CatMate will let us mark the piece that we're missing next is uh, logging in uh, as a user and getting that moving. And um, we're also need, we need to touch base again with Sergey on the importing the synapse positions into the NeuroML model and and getting that algorithm uh, you know wired up and, and moving well. I think he was the next one. He's going to take a step on that. Uh, um, related yeah. to that, um, I've just committed some things to the uh, C. Elegans uh, Neuroconstruct project on oh, yeah. parsing that uh, SQL database dump. Oh, really? um, what I've done is basically converted it to a um, uh, SQL Lite database, which is basically just a single file um, that you contains the in contents of the database. And you can use SQLite to parse that database, issue SQL commands, and there's a Python API for SQLite. So if you download that, there's a Python script there which will um, effectively um, allow you to uh, go through that database and pull anything out that you want and dump it into text files, into potentially XML and so on, which might be quite useful. Oh, awesome. Can you um, post a link to that? Python file? I can. Uh, it's in the very latest. Um, uh, S I've committed to the uh, C. Elgin's project, but I can just link to it here. Yeah. Um, and which, which Python file it is will help. To yeah. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Um, but it's using one of the older uh, insufficient uh, SQL dumps, but in theory, the same method could be used for um, parsing an updated uh, SQL dump from the full system. 
Ah, so we did get we did get some updated things um, since the last time I think we saw. So I, yeah, I did look there, and it seemed to be SVS CSV files. Uh, yes, yes, a few a few versions that we got back and forth talking with um, with Stephen Cook. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, pot potentially, um, if there are things, I, I think looking at those very briefly, it, it, they did seem like uh, just um, extracting uh, data from single tables in the uh, database into uh, CSV files. But if you had the whole database to play with in Python, then you could link between the different um, tables, depending on how the data there is structured. But it's a start. I mean, it doesn't do anything at the moment, but uh, it's just one way to actually try to pull that data out. Okay. Cool. You're good. Thank you for that. Um, so I think we also need to loop uh, Sergey in on that. OK. Um, let's just um, see if we're going. So then Epic 2. Um, uh, launching the simulation engine on Amazon AWS. Um, I think so we're continuing to make progress on that. Um, some of my um, explorations this uh, this last uh, couple days with the development environment and just you know playing more and more with Amazon instances um, is leading to that. So um, I'd like to map that out a bit more um, in terms of what the sub steps of that are. But um, a lot of the efforts that I have now packaging these things up and getting um, AMIs that uh, have have what we have for the engine right now is um, all leading as prerequisites to that. OK. Um, as a user, I want to see the body of the worm moving and changing color, driven by the activity of the simulation engine. So this is one where we've, um, this is kind of our reach goal. Um, and I think that um, uh, you know we have different pieces and parts of what we're doing that are kind of aiming towards this. Um, I don't know that this is being executed as a single project by any single you know, group, or this is uh, kind of going to be the result of many different things. But um, simulation data stream with the client. So, you know, Gleb made an update on that um, about several weeks back that uh, had a mock uh, WebSockets client. So that was under that under that point. Um, 3D visualization of C elegans that moves in a WebGL in a WebGL enabled browser. The progress under WebGL visualization of SPH is contributing to that. Um, I want models to be loaded from external files and not hard coded. Uh, that's something that we have yet to, I think, pick up and, and, and do some extra work on. So if folks are looking for things to do here, uh, that might be useful. Um, I want to see neurons and muscle cells in the worm changing color depending on the model variables. Uh, that's another thing on the front end that we could think about adding. Um, you know, we've got some particles moving around um, that are based on, you know, a dummy stream coming from the back end. Now, you know, what would it take to have uh, some geometry whose color changes as well? That's, that's going to be important because for our muscle cell, we basically want to have it moving and we want to have it change in color at the same time. So um, being able to control color changes based on client input um, through WebGL is, uh, is important. So that's, that's a place to, to contribute in there. Um, and then let's see, uh, as a user, I want to launch a simulation engine and be presented with an option to see the moving worm body. OK, that's basically just a, a GUI interface piece uh, that's needed. Um, as a developer, I want to simulate a simplified neuron with networks inspired by the cyber elegant neurons. That's another one that I think is um, a bit orphaned at the moment. Um, the folks want to talk more about that. I'm going to start uh, looking at this T3. I'm going to switch my focus on that uh, just because now the neuronal demo is like, finished. So my okay. goal is to help out with the SPH backend and start uh, working on those pieces. Okay, awesome. So let me uh, let me put you down for that. Um, okay, wait. I'll do it in a minute. It's close, I think. All right, great. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Um, okay, so as a user, I want to be able to run a simulation that includes muscle cell physics as well as muscle cell membrane excitability. This is the whole closing the loop around the single muscle cell. Um, Browser-based visualization to show me the muscle cell output. Okay, again, Epic 7 is kind of prerequisite to that. Uh, launch a simulation engine and be presented with a choice to see muscle cell simulation. That's also graphic. 
Uh, I wanted to have a Java library implementing SPH capable of simulating mechanics of muscle cell. Okay, that that is uh, the thing that we've been making progress on, and we just heard from uh, Andre. That's where that piece fits in. So, bravo for making progress on that. Um, obviously, at this point, it's still C++, but it will. Well, our no, strategy. We have a Java version of that. We just need to integrate the latest changes into the solver in, in the simulation engine. Exactly. Exactly. You took the words right out of my mouth. Bingo. Yeah. Sorry. So, so that's so we're moving there. Uh, as a developer, I want to elaborate a simulated conductance-based model of C. elegans muscle cell. Um, so yeah, so that one we're going to have to get back to as well um, in terms of incorporating the probably the boil model with um, the conductances that are there. Um, so moving beyond just the Hodgkin Huxley um, into that piece. Um, okay, so. Things to go there. Uh, detailed written summary of the physiology of intended to the model. Uh, that one, and um, you know, we. This is where um, the, um, the paper outline, uh, create paper outline for um, a milestone milestone publication. That's where that is needed, as well as the thing that I just mentioned to Tim that we need, which is compare the data sets used to simulate the car whole cell model with data sets available for C elegans. Um, that's where that part would come in very handy uh, as well. Um, we can get that going. So those so at least we're outlining this one which had been kind of uh, <laughs> staying empty for a while. Um, and then obviously we need to you know make progress beyond that. Um, but those are two really important steps. Okay, optimized data matching experimental results. We're going to meet on this um, uh, either at the end of this week or, or next week. This part I think has been suffering for uh, lack of attention on my part. I apologize for that. Um, let's get back to it. Um, let me see if I can rope Mike in as well. Um, move forward. Okay, and then lastly, the one which is kind of I think the exciting one that, that um, you know, now a lot of people can focus on is the WebGL visualization of the smooth particle hydrodynamics. Um, we do have random particles activated um, in that front end. Now we want to see those particles actually being driven by SPH simulation. Um, as we you know, get the C++ incorporated into the Java, this will be more likely uh, to, to happen. Um, I think one of the things here as well, we wanted to have that 3D scene defined by JSON scene graph. Um, and fed into the WebGL JavaScript library of choice. Um, so some work needs to go on there. Um, have Java library implementing SPH capable of simulating mechanics liquid elastic matter. Okay, we've, we've also seen that's actually a duplicate uh, story with one of the other epics. We probably gotta uh, reconcile those. Um, I don't know. Are you, how do you link them? Is there a way to say that it's the same or? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Let's look at that. Um, we may just want to. We may just want to change the ep the epic order around because with the prerequisites for one on the other, um, we may find that actually something is a subpart of something else. Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then also this uh, loading from external files thing and not hard coded is another piece I think we need, we need progress on. I was hoping that. Uh, that Chris Tall, our, our contributor who jumped on last time, might be able to start on that piece. Um, I think um, uh, he may have gotten a little stuck, so we may need another, another person to, to hop in on that. But I think yeah. Matteo has done work on that. Um, oh yeah. Okay, that's good. So we'll, we may hear more about that next time. We have we have a schema. He did produce a sample XML. We just. So I, I'm, I'm sure I don't, don't know exactly what's missing, but I'm sure that that's like a good point. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, I just wanted to review those things um, because it's easy, I think, to get unfocused as we kind of go through a six-month uh, plan, you know, and it's easy to kind of uh, not see what the big picture is. But again, the big, the big exciting deliverables from this, right, are for the first time to get a, you know, a, a, a truly... Uh, close the loop between the browser and the back end so that um, when people come in and they're like, hey, so you're building a simulation, they can actually see something meaningful. 
um, rather than um, you know just loading up some code and running it and uh, you know maybe getting some numbers out. Um, by November, following this plan, we've got a very tangible, uh, very tangible progress on that. Um, so I'm excited, even if it's not you know the full worm moving, if it's at least combining these algorithms where we have some piece moving and we have um, some electrical activity, um, we'll have a base that um, we can engage other people who are unfamiliar with some of the biology and move that forward. So really appreciate um, everybody's efforts towards getting th those pieces moving. Also, uh, again, the, a the Amazon Web Services, the big picture strategy there, again, something that doesn't happen in a lot of simulators, is um, to, to really ha give people a fully set up environment to get going uh, with, with the setup um, themselves, whether it's just the development environment or whether it's um, you know, running this, the simulators, um, because there can be a lot of complex steps to building this thing, that's also going to lower the barrier of entry. Um, the you know, open source project um, is basically measured on how many contributors it can attract and how many you know, contributors it can, it can um, maintain, and having these things put in place is going to, you know, I think, help scale this project from you know, the efforts that we have to having other people being able to kind of um, you know, update asynchronously um, and this kind of thing. So I'm, I'm excited about those things. Um, I'm also um, excited about some of the papers you know, that are coming out. I think this Balash paper is really great. I really do hope you guys get a chance to read that in the next two weeks and um, you know, contribute some feedback. He's put a lot of effort into it. Um, it's excellent. I also think that um, thinking about you know, another publication that goes along with it will be, um, you know, will be excellent to represent you know, the efforts that, that we've all done. Again, all of you who put in the time on here um, you know, will be authors. Um, on that next uh, on that next paper, as we are representing our results, so um, you know, and that's also something where you know we will sponsor the um, we will find a way to sponsor the publication in open access journals. Um, so thank you again for you know contributing, and and that's one way in which we you know can can ha have the time that you've invested be represented in something you know more tangible. Um, so I'm excited to get that moving. Um, and then the Synapse Marking Project, which I think is the one that um, has really been soaring a lot faster than I had even anticipated, but I'm really excited about. I mean, there's a, an opportunity to make a contribution to this data set of this connectome where we've never, um, where, you know, the field has never had Synapse positions incorporated in, you know, a NeuroML model. In fact, I can't think of any circuit anywhere that's been published where um, even you've gotten close to having the right positions for Synapses based on actual, you know, reconstructed EM data set, right? Like, you don't have that for Cortex, you don't have that for Cerebellum. I mean, just anywhere in neuroscience, you do not have a marked up computational model that has approximately close um, synapse position. So, although, you know, we don't get exact because of some of the simplifications, we're not directly using the EM, uh, you know, for our neuron models, the fact that we can even get within, you know, um, you know, some fraction of a millimeter a fraction of a, a micrometer um, is, 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 is really impressive and I think will be a really great story. So um, all of those efforts, um, really exciting. And um, this is about kind of the halfway point, I think, between, uh, you know, where we started and, uh, and November. So I, you know, uh, I know folks are busy, folks are moving, folks have, you know, summer camp, and so not everybody has the ability to show up at the same time. But, um, but there is a lot of progress. I see a lot of things happening you know, in emails every week, um, you know, moving back and forth. So, again, thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for the patience for those of you who, uh, where it's, it's been harder to connect. Um, and thanks for folks who've made the contributions as they have. Um, I'm really excited to see where this is going to go um, in the next few months. Um, so that's me blabbering on. Any other closing comments from any of you? I think. Want to relate? Uh, you want to go ahead, Pater? Uh, yeah. I just wanted to say that uh, I'll be going back home for a couple of weeks, so I don't know that I'm going to make the, the next meeting. Okay. I'll try, but I don't know. Might be on the beach. That's fine. So we'll, um, yeah. so we'll be having it at the same time in two weeks. Um, it, you know, if, um, if there's progress that I can represent that you've done, please just you know, send me an email. Okay. You know, okay. uh, that's no problem. Anybody else? Sure. All right. Awesome, everybody. Thanks a lot. Um, we'll be in touch. Okay. See you soon.
All right. It's fine. Bye-bye. See you later. See you. Bye-bye.